Hello and welcome to Unlock Your Funding Potential. I'm Brody Guy. I'm Dean McKinley. Hi there. We're with Northern Development, and we've developed this online workshop based on the experience of grant writers from across Central and Northern British Columbia over the last number of years, and also our own experience writing grants and working in the world of funding and fundraising. So the goal of the workshop is really just to empower you with specialized knowledge, give you techniques, a lot of tricks and tips that will really make you a successful grant writer. Yeah, sort of inside information from a funder's perspective. And so the way the workshop breaks down is in seven keys. We're going to cover each one of the ones you see here, and in some cases spend five minutes or less. And in other cases, we're going to get into a lot of detail and give you some very specialized, detailed tactics on how to be successful in writing grants. The guide to the workshop is a companion document that you'll see here um, that you can download on the Northern Development website as a PDF. You can view that on your computer or print it out if you want to make notes and go, go with that as we proceed through the workshop. Um, the keys, the icon you see with the key, that's where we're just trying to show you a, a certain trick or tactic that would be very important for you in writing proposals and the documents icon is going to refer to any content found in that workshop companion Dean just showed. So you can make notes of that. So if you need to, you can you can pause this and download that uh, companion and, and just jump back in. Absolutely, for sure. So we'll start with the first key, which is prepare to succeed. Before you get going, before you write grants, it's all about preparations. You don't want to uh, get off on the wrong track, and, and it's easy for things to unravel quickly if you're not prepared. So we're going to show you different ways that we think are important to, to your preparation. Firstly, as the grant writer, you really need to assume a leadership role. And in doing that, it's all about taking a lot of initiative and getting people on board. So just using your passion and getting everyone excited about what's happening. And doing that with your team, that might be stakeholders from your community, people on nonprofit boards, community staff. There's a number of people you might be working with in your, in your special situation, but collaborating with those people is so important. Don't work in isolation. Work with everyone you possibly can, get the best value out of your team. And in doing that, really actively listening. That's all about getting the information that everyone might have to contribute to the project and different perspectives. That's going to really help you as far as developing the scope of the project and how you're going to present that to the funding agencies or programs you're applying to. Influence is very important as a grant writer because often you'll be working with people that are quite senior, whether that be the chair of an organization, uh, of a nonprofit, uh, community leaders, even mayors, counselors, or senior staff. So being able to influence those people that you don't have a direct relationship with and working with people from around the community is going to be so important in using your leadership. And getting consensus with everyone is going to be extremely important, especially before you write any grants, to have everyone on board, everyone understanding what the project might be, what the initiative program you want to do is, and everyone's on board and very supportive of you. And the last tip we have is keep everyone organized. In your role, you're going to be the glue that keeps the project together until the, it's fully funded. So to be able to keep track of everything, keep timelines, all those things are going to be so important. Uh, to move forward. Yeah, if it seems daunting, I mean, it's not necessarily daunting, but it certainly is a big responsibility and a big workload. And one thing that's very clear when you start to uh, work as a grant writer is you've got to be prepared to do the heavy lifting. And that takes a lot of focus. It takes a lot of time of time and effort because it's a, it's a big job to walk a project from the early stages through to the funding to see it through. And uh, as was previously mentioned, collaboration is extremely important. Uh, you need a great team around you, and you've got to be able to have them all working together well in order to take ideas and turn them into successful projects. So, uh, you also need to take uh, some direct ownership of the outcomes of the project yourself and understand that your efforts are going to make a big difference for that project and often your efforts make a huge difference for the community, especially for small communities. And we work with a lot of small communities throughout central and northern British Columbia. It's really your passion as a grant writer that you can get actually a lot more out of people by just yeah. being excited. And, and your passion tends to rub off on, on your community. It rubs off on funders as well. Because um, at the end of the day, if grant writing was easy and if getting funding for projects was easy, every proposal would be funded. And money would be falling from the sky 
you just be reaching out and grabbing money. And we all know that that's not the case. Hasn't been for years, and yeah. and it's very competitive in the world of money. It is a very competitive business, actually. Yeah, it's very true. And that brings us to the second key, investing your time in promising ideas. Because it takes so much time and energy to move something forward, you want to make sure you're focusing all your time in the ideas that have the most chance of success. And one of the ways to do that is to engage your, your colleagues and stakeholders early and get a wish list together. What are the types of things you'd like to be able to get funding for? And you can brainstorm all those ideas and then collaboratively rank them into a list. And you want to do it collaboratively so everybody sort of shares ownership of what they think the important things are to proceed it's with. Really just a simple list yeah. of everything that everyone's thought of. That's right. Put it in order. Very yeah. easy. And then you can go through that list, start to do a little preliminary research, some assessment, and find out what it what is it that has the highest chance of potential early. And one of the keys here is work smart. Focus on those ideas that have a really good chance of becoming real projects and can be implemented in your community. So important. I mean, if you're chasing a project that ultimately no funding agency is going to see as a strategic investment, yeah. then obviously you're, you're already not going to be successful. You yeah. spend a lot of your time. Or it's a project that's a great idea, but there's no real chance it can be implemented. Absolutely. So, I mean, we'll go through some of the different criteria, but this is a good place to start as far yeah. as your ideas. Picking some ones that make some sense and for what reasons. So, really, what we'll do now is, and just referring back to the document icon that we have there, page three of the companion, if you want to make note of that, we'll have uh, notes there that you um, can make. <laughs> Sorry, I screwed that up. Let's just uh, start the slide over. Yeah. Talk. So, um, Okay, so now we're going to give you a, diff a few different tips on how to assess the project ideas that you have in your list so you can figure out which ones are the most promising ideas and which ones might be worth the most amount of your time. Um, because obviously, as a grant writer, you're going to have be somewhat limited in the amount of work that you can do and the amount of projects you can undertake. And so it's so important to go through the criteria. So assessing the project scope. Has the project been clearly defined? And how do you figure that out? Well, the main things that we've looked at uh, for grant writers is the activities and costs. Have those been identified or estimated? So in a sense, you might have an idea of a project, but what are the specific deliverables that would need to be undertaken in order to make it a reality? And you can split those easily into capital costs and operating costs. Capital costs are things like buying buildings or equipment that you might need to do a project, whereas operational costs could be like ongoing salaries that would be multi-year. It's not just a one-time yeah. thing. Um, or it might just be um, the project manager during the time that the project's being done. So if you can, I mean, we're, we're giving it a green light here. Uh, it's pretty good. You do know your project scope if you know those things, and if you know if there's a pre preliminary timeline. Yeah, and for this whole section, we'll sort of go through where things look like they're a go and where things probably look like they need to be reassessed or it might not be worth proceeding. Yes, absolutely. So where you can look at it and say there may be some issues on your ideas if the project may be at the early idea stage if um, you don't know what the scope is, you don't know what's involved, you don't really know the costs or activities. So the two suggestions on all these that we say is it's not a no-go if you see the red X. It just means that you should really like either go and look at some other projects yeah. that you might have so you can really now be prioritizing a little bit better. Or if the people that have the idea, it might not have been an idea that you came up with, but the nonprofit board or community group or what have you that you're working with, go back to them and say, you know what, give me more about this idea. Tell yeah. me a bit more about it and put the work on them. That's all about that leadership role part. Uh, really important. And using your influence. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So the next thing we want to assess is the capacity to deliver the project. So is this something that if you put the time and energy into sourcing funding for, it can actually become a real project on the ground? So if uh, you've already got some dedicated financial resources and staff from the organization, it could be a community or not-for-profit, and they've got the expertise to deliver it, well, then that's a big green light to keep going. Um, if they don't have those things, you may want to look at uh, other projects on your list that are more achievable to focus your time and energy on to pursue grants with. And uh, it's another one of those things, just like trying to get the scope further defined. It might be, okay, you've got an idea. 
um, maybe you could go back and see, uh, you know, what is it going to take to get the resources to make this thing real before we proceed with funding? Yeah, it's a question of whether or not this group is going to bite off more than they can yeah. shoot. And so it's either figuring it out, like you say, or moving on. That's right. Um, so with the project costs, we talked a bit about the scope with the first as a piece of assessment, but now we're looking at the budget really specifically. And to know if you have a good budget, I mean, we're going to green light this big time for you if you have suppliers that have been engaged, meaning that there's some quotes involved. So if it was like a renovations project, you could be looking at like, well, is it flooring or are you buying kitchen equipment? Um, there's all kinds of things like that. You would want to have quotes because that's going to really inform you as far as how much funding are you going to need to do the project. And it's really important you do that before you start filling out proposals. There could be some issues if you don't have a project budget. So maybe just go and find out what the suppliers are, work with the colleagues and stakeholders that are on your project team, and try to distribute the work so that you can all pull together on that and get the information you need on a budget. That's right. So important. So next, uh, <coughs> what's the funding you've got committed to this project? So on the good side, if you've got uh, the organization you're with has already got some finances that they can commit to the project, that's excellent. If there's already some partners identified that have some money they can put in on the project, then they've confirmed that that's excellent as well. So when you don't have that, um, a lot of funders, and, and we're one of those funders, we like to see that the applicant is committing to the, to the project, so mm -hmm. the actual money. In some cases, it can be... Um, not just money, but it can be volunteer labor as well, but we want to see that the applicant is making a financial contribution. So either you can work with the partners to see if they can come up with some money. If they don't have some resources already, it might be uh, time to stop with the, uh, you know, moving forward maybe with the grant application now and to start some local fundraising so you can start to build that equity from the yeah. applicant. So if you're a real small nonprofit without a lot of money, the fundraising is going to take care of that. Funders yeah. appreciate that, no problem. There's a lot of work that goes into that. That's right. So assessing funding opportunities, really important at this idea stage when you're screening these. So what funding programs have been identified? You may have identified some or none at all at this point because it's just at that idea. But it's really quite a good project idea at this point, we think, if there have been some funding programs or organizations. We've seen it where community groups might have, there might be a government announcement on uh, gaming grants or different types of uh, funding that comes available through program announcements, and then community groups would build projects to meet those. Yeah. And that's absolutely fine and acceptable, and you get a green light here. Um, but if you've just, you're looking at an idea that someone's just come up with, it makes sense for the group, makes sense for the community, you need to figure out what funding programs are going to be there to support it, be aligned with it. Could be some issues if you don't know any of the funding programs, so you just have a project idea at that point. First step, get on the internet. It's so obviously it's going to be free. You just need to get access to a computer and Google, and uh, spend some time going through typing in keywords. This is really what Dean and I do actually when we help community groups. Is just get on Google. It's the best search engine for that. Um, and then basically you can look at like if there's no strong funding matches that you're either aware of or you're finding out through basic internet searches then you might want to pursue other funding opportunities or either work with the community um, economic developers or folks like ourselves to say, could you help us out? We have this idea. That's right. And we're going to get into this a little more uh, later on, but there's identifying programs, and one of the keys is identifying programs that are actually strongly aligned with the project that you want to do. So uh, next is assessing community support. How aware and how supportive is the community of this project? Because it's of utmost importance. So if you've got letters of support from the community, maybe a, you know, a, a resolution from council, you've got user groups, clubs, and they're willing to put pen to paper, and you've got uh, letters of support from them, that's fantastic. Political support from your mayor, your local government, your, uh, your MLA, MP, local First Nations, is an excellent form of support if you can get a letter of support. That really shows that there's strong support for the project and really looks good to all the funding agencies that are out there. If there isn't a lot of uh, awareness, especially if it's awareness or support, um, you might need to advise your stakeholders to get engaged with that community prior to applying because all of the funders are going to want to see that you've got the community engaged mm -hmm. and that the community is very supportive of what you're trying to do. There's a good match between what you're trying to do as an independent group and the greater good of the community. 
and that's so often people forget that stuff. Yeah. And so it's easy actually. If people yeah. are, you know, if you're passionate and your community group's doing something good in the community, people are going to get behind that. No problem. Yeah. If you're excited about it, your stakeholders are excited about it. It's usually pretty easy to get more user groups in the community excited about it. For sure. So those were some of the sort of preliminary screening that we'd yeah. say you do with those ideas. And this is this lot, this um, area we're going to talk about turning that wish list into a real project list. So now that you've assessed everything with those basic criteria, you can really want to re-rank all your ideas. And that's going to be super helpful. Take that list back and meet with your colleagues, stakeholders, whoever is part of your grant writing project team, and talk about the project list and try to set that up as your grant writing priorities. Everyone's involved. They have a safe early in the process as far as which, which project ideas you're going to chase. You may just be picking one or it might be a number. That's going to be interesting and it's going to be up to you how you do that process. But do advise your, your team on what ideas require more work because like, this isn't a stage where you want to take something that was in the idea list and it was just an early idea. And if no one keeps working on it, it'll never move forward to being one of those good ideas that becomes a high priority project item. So try to work with the team and say, okay, I'm going to write grants for the ones that are like near term and that we can actually get funding for. Yeah. But how about you guys go on? You do a bit more of this work on areas where we had the red axis and fill those in so that we can move forward and we'll just have a pipeline of projects for our community group. It's like a continuum, really. You're always working on something. That's it. That's exactly right. You really don't want to like drop off a bunch of ideas. I mean, there might be some that just aren't going to be going forward, but there's going to be a lot that are just at different stages of the development cycle. So just think about that. So now we're on to the third key, which is building your game plan. You have your project list. You've worked through all the consultation. Right. People are aware. Everyone's supportive of what you're going to work on. You need that game plan for each of the projects you're going to work on. And I think what's interesting about this, and it's just sort of a historical one, with UCLA, is that John Wooden, and I mean, he's quite a famous coach. He's over 40 years, I think. Over 40 years, and mentor to a number of people. But in his spare time, he was a grant writer. And that's something that a lot of people aren't aware of. I was not aware of that. Yeah, and I think this quote speaks quite proudly about like his passion for grant writing. And I think that, that's something we wouldn't want to miss on this. Just move forward. So first, in building that game plan, you want to get organized. And you don't want to be like this person in that photo. It's going to be really easy, especially if you have two or three projects and you're writing to a couple of different funding agencies. You're going to be drowning in paper, and it's just going to get out of control, and you're going to miss a lot of things. So right now, look at that project list. Figure out what are the missing pieces. It might have been those red axes that we've identified. There might be a bunch of other little things that you're needing to work on. And that's not going to be a problem. You just need to get organized now before it's too late. And... We just, you know, we're not big paperwork people ourselves, Dean and I, oh. <laughs> but uh, we'd say create a file for every project so you can organize it. And it's like those letters of sports, quotes, project plans. There's all kinds of your budgets, quotes from suppliers. I mean, you might get quotes from like three, four suppliers for any one like, part of your project. So it's going to be a lot of paperwork. Just think about that and get organized. Certainly successful grant writers we've talked to uh, all <coughs> stress the importance of being highly organized as a grant writer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of the, they're carrying that they're carrying a huge load, right? So they they need to be organized to do that. So back to uh, just a referral that we we do have an example of a grant tracking tool in the companion PDF document that you you might refer to at this point. Um, but that's going to be really important to you as far as like listing and looking at all the work that you're working on, yeah. what your milestones are, you know, and as you proceed. Yeah. Whatever way you like to stay organized that works best for you is the one yes, you use. You should. And we've just got that suggestion there in case you're new to grant writing. It might help. Um, some of the things before you're applying that you'd be required as far as documents, it's going to be those letters of support, quotes. Council resolutions are really important. What council resolutions are, if it's a First Nation, then that's a bad council resolution where you take it to chief and council, and they're going to um, decide if they're very supportive of your project that you're going to apply for funding on. Or in the municipal world, that's the mayor and the, and the councillors. So um, that's an official meeting. Um, you go before council in either case and get a resolution written up. Very important stuff. Scope of work, which is just your costs and all the budgeting that you need to know. The next would be the status and the amounts of all the grant uh, applications. You're going to track all that because you might be... We've seen grant writers that um, if they had a $100,000 project, they've actually written for... Well over that, yeah. You know, well, well over that, hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants because they don't assume that they'll get all the ones they write. 
So that might be your style, or you might be carefully building uh, partnerships to get a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Sort of two different ways of doing it, but you're gonna, either way you're going to need to track the status and the amounts that you're applying to. Lastly, on this slide is the tasks and milestones. You're going to want to just keep track of what do you need to do next. Yeah. On your timeline specifically, identify the critical timelines. So it's like a, this is project management, pure and simple. The dates of all the meetings that are important. So if there's a nonprofit board meeting that needs to get together to look at and say, okay, we're comfortable with your with the budget, we're comfortable with the finances, we're going to take money out of our bank account, or we're going to do fundraising for this. That's an example of a very important meeting we need to keep track of. Just like the council that I was speaking to just before. Uh, time for the suppliers to provide quotes. Um, depending on how um, how uh, more detailed the work might be involved, it might take quite a bit of time to get quotes. Depends if, also if you're a rural community, if you can have like suppliers come out and visit the site that you're looking at and give you proper quotations. Uh, build in that time into your project plan. And if you're raising money and donations, and if you need volunteers to help you with your project, make sure you have time. And quite a bit of time, actually. More time than you'll, if you think you need X amount of time, give yourself more time. That's the bit, one thing we've learned. Yeah. So the fourth key we're going to talk about is, is crafting a compelling story. <clears throat> and uh, this is a great shot of Ernest Hemingway. I always like this picture and always like this quote. And uh, just like John Wooden, he, he did a lot yes. of writing, doubled as a grant writer. So, uh, Nowadays, you wouldn't do the grant applications probably on an old Underwood typewriter. We've seen that happen, but it's usually <laughs> electronics preferred. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, graduated to the, to the wonderful world of PDF forms these days. So the idea on this one is uh, write proposals itself. And because successful proposals are going to start with a strong project outline. And really what you're going to find uh, throughout this presentation as we go with a, a tremendous amount of the success in getting funding for a project happens well before you ever submit a grant application. And this is a part of that. So write a first draft of the project outline and then take it right back to your colleagues and your stakeholders. Don't get too far ahead of, of yourself before you get buy-in from everyone you're working with. Focus on creating um, an opportunity for funders to become involved in your project. Funders want to be excited about their investments as well. Uh, here's, we're going to go through individually a whole bunch of features of what we would consider uh, what would make up a strong project outline. And we'll go through each one of these as we move forward here. So starting with the name, the compelling project name, which is really the first uh, chance you have to introduce your project and acts like an elevator pitch, right? Anchors the project story and helps funders, uh, potential funders, get excited about it. So the keys to doing this, try to grab some attention and be unique. Keep it concise. You don't want a really long, drawn-out project name. Try to connect the name of the project with some of the outcomes you're trying to accomplish with your project and uh, relate and describe the project in the title. Don't get too corny or weird. We've seen a few ones where it was grabbing attention. It was, it was unique. Getting. It was sort of compelling, but it lost it with being yeah. too corny. And it also didn't have anything to do with what they were trying to do. And I mean, at the end of the day, um, one of our reasons for that is, and, and for all these points here on the keys, is that it's going to end up either on a minister's desk, mm -hmm. sign off eventually, or in front of a board of directors, depending on the funding agency and how yeah. those decisions get made. And you know, it, it ultimately would also end up on signage. Yeah, on the four, highway. four by eight sign that has that project name on it. So, it, you know, you want to be taking it pretty, uh, you know, serious and giving yourself the proper credit and due, yeah. but being very compelling. It's the first thing a potential funder sees, and it matters. It also shows up like in a list of projects where um, there could be like 500 different projects listed, yeah. and if you have that grab, that uh, project name that grabs attention, it's going to stick out. That's going to help you out a lot, especially if it's a call for proposals, there's 500 applications, there's enough money to go to under 100. Yeah. The name's going to be important. Yeah. It's always an hour. Dean has a great point with that. So, secondly, on your out, uh, we think the second thing, and really, the name is on the cover of your project outline. Yeah. Envision Outcomes is the first thing you should really be speaking to and fleshing out for in your outline for the funder to be reading ultimately. And this outlines the anticipated results. So you might think, 
that doesn't really, you know, why would you start with the outcomes? Why would you, we haven't even told you what we want to do yeah. yet. You describe the project. But because the funders in, in, the funders are always investing in outcomes. That might be job creation, that might be heritage revitalization, yeah. that might be healthy active youth in the communities. There's all kinds of things, and that's what the funder is looking for. So go to that immediately. Grab their attention. Don't waste any time at all. The keys to doing that effectively that we've seen have been really think of it in terms of a return on investment. In the case of healthy, active, engaged youth, speak to that. Think about like how many youth would it be that you're pro are going to go through your program? Re heritage revitalization, what's the age and history of the building, what's its significance to the community? That's the kind of things you could think of right away for the funders. And secondly, secondly, describe the outcomes that will form the long-term legacy of the project. What's going to be around, if you're going to do a project for four months, or one year, however long this is going to take with the money you're going to be getting from grants, what's going to happen in the long term? What's the benefits to the community? That's really important to go through. That's right. And now we can talk about what is the project. So this is the project description. is just an overview of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Keys to this. Try to use an appealing and positive approach to your writing style as part of crafting that compelling story. Mm -hmm. Fully outline the scope of the project, but do it in a clear and concise way. Um, it's better to say it with less words and have it mean more. There's been the odd person to write a couple pager, and that might be a little bit more than is needed because, yeah. especially in the case of hundreds of applications, yeah, you don't want to have give three pages and the person only reads one paragraph out of that. That's right, and, and when you review a, a lot of different applications, you really you really appreciate uh, well-written, concise descriptions, and it makes you feel like the the applicant actually is highly organized and, and probably has an excellent chance of moving the project forward. Yes, this is such an indication of how well the project might be done. Yeah. This how it's, how it's written for sure. Oops. And there you go. Try to write it for a non-expert audience because uh, funding agencies aren't necessarily very familiar with the type of project you're doing or the, the type of group that you're doing it for. It might be technical details. And yeah. Ian and I have seen that where it's a little bit into engineering or yeah. something. We're, you know, believe it or not, we're not engineers. Yeah, we're not engineers. <laughs> so um, it's so important that any, anyone reading it can understand. That you're that's doing. right. Okay, now I'll transition to the next one. Uh, motivation and rationale. We think that's a great title. This is really the why are you doing the project section. And this is going to describe in a compelling way the needs that you're going to address in the community or, or region of your project. Keys to doing it really quite effectively that we've seen have been to describe how the scope of work, so write the section Dean just talked about that you're going to write in a concise way. Well, how are those activities, those costs, those that, that type of work you're going to undertake really going to specifically address the needs? So link everything up. And, well, link those up. So link the needs to the outcomes you've envisioned. That's exactly what you need to be doing. Next, we're going to look at the capacity of the organization to deliver. How are they going to succeed in undertaking and delivering this project? Keys to this are another concise overview of the organization's mission and mandate. Who are you and what is the organization all about? And then highlight what it is that that organization brings to the table in terms of people and expertise to put that project in play. If it's their staff, their board of directors, who are the key volunteers those types of pieces of information. And then describe the organization's ability to sustain the outcomes of the project. And this is extremely important for a lot of funders. And we're one of those funders that really wants to uh, invest in projects that are going to have a long-term impact and can continue to go from the time it starts uh, to years into the future. Yeah. And actually, so often we don't see this section written at all. Yeah. And so we're led to assume... And I think government programs don't necessarily always ask that question. So yeah. if you can give that in your outline, I mean, it's going to just give that confidence in, your, right. in the organization. Who are your partners? So important. Are you doing this alone? Or is there an immense groundswell of community support? That's right. That's, that's what you want to try to show. So keys to doing this in your outline would be to not just show who's involved, but what are the roles and what kind of contribution are they going to be making to the project? Are they just purely supportive? Do they have a financial role? Are they going to benefit? Those are types of things you can think about listing. Um, if they have unique expertise, leverage it. Put it in there. Talk about it. 
because it's going to show that you're bringing in people that all have a unique contribution that they're making that your organization alone wouldn't be as um, well prepared if they weren't so collaborative and so tied into all the different partnerships that they have. Timelines would be next. So that's going to show clearly how this project is going to happen over time. So outline some of the key dates for the project. And that would be sort of when the project will be completely fleshed out in terms of what's going to happen and how much it's going to cost. Uh, dates for when all the fundraising will be completed and, and uh, when you think that will be done. When the project will actually start. What some of the key milestone dates are. So all the different phases uh, after the start toward the finish. And when you anticipate the project will be all wrapped up. Those are all sort of key things that most funding organizations are going to want you to have a handle on as part of an application for. And how awesome is it for you to know these things right at this stage yep. before you're real, even writing a single grant? That's right. A lot of funders also want to know what is the what current stage is the project at right now? And that has a lot to do with both uh, how organized are you and in some cases funding eligibility. So it's really uh, yeah. important to note on your outline where it is at this time. I, I, you know, at time your project is already proceeding and you just need uh, there's an extra phase you could be yeah. adding to it. That's kind of where that would be really important. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Preliminary budget. So again, it may be early days, but what are the kind of costs that you're looking at? What are the estimated amounts? So some of the keys to this for every cost item list the type of expense. And you can categorize them by is it a capital expense, operational expense? Sort of a project management, or are you hiring a consultant? That's, that can be very important for funders to see it and have that separated. Um, is there volunteer labor? We call that in kind, and we'll give you a little bit of better description of that later when we get into the industry jargon section of uh, yeah. the world of funding. But um, volunteer labor is important to note that if you do have it. And then we're going to look at um, how much of the funding that you need to make this project real has already been confirmed. Some of the keys to that are uh, take a look at the direct financial investment that uh, the applicant is going to contribute or the organization. List all of the partners that are going to be contributing to the project and how much they've confirmed to date. And by confirmed, it usually means you've got a letter from them confirming their financial commitment to the project. Um, and just like money, and unlike uh, maybe volunteer time, if they're providing something that uh, they can provide an estimate for, like uh, Maybe it's loads of gravel or lifts of lumber. If they're donating that type of material, you can uh, you can show that as well. Um, and then you want to specify any volunteer labor separately, and you can list if it's skilled labor or unskilled labor. And I think we get into that in a little more detail later Absolutely. on as well. And then show the vo the dollar values of the of the funding still required in order to move the project forward. And you know it's absolutely okay at this point if. You don't have any funding identified, right. or maybe it's just your own from the community group or the yeah. um, the actual nonprofit or, or yeah. municipality that you're writing grants for. That's okay. Yeah, this just helps you show exactly where you're at. Exactly, that's super helpful. So potential funding sources. So that's for whatever amount you don't know, you don't have funding for. You want to start listing organizations, and this is your preliminary ideas to your research on whether it be just the internet or talk to folks like us to give you a hand. That's kind of where this comes in. Keith's doing a good job of that. Is if you're um, if you're noting grant amounts, just check that they're actually in line with funding program criteria first. So if you were talking about like a provincial funding program, um, you'd want to go check it out and say, well, does this program give a hundred thousand dollar grant? Because if the limit is twenty thousand dollars and you start penciling them down as a hundred, that might not come across like extremely well when you send it to them. Plus, you're starting to build expectations that you're getting that money there. You might end up having uh, a shortfall later, basically, That's what right. that comes into. So just have a check if you're starting to put dollar amounts in, that they might be actually realistic. And, you know, if you don't know what the funding criteria is, you can just end up talking with funders. And what we say in your project outline is you can put pro uh, funding agency and funding program names in, as far as your ideas of who might fund it. Mm -hmm. And if you really have no idea how much money they give you, then leave a blank. That's yeah. absolutely fine for now. Just yeah. start to show the funding partnerships and who you're going to talk to. Yeah. Um, starting to put dollars down before you check is usually a little bit more of a risky game. Yeah, at least it shows that you're doing your research mm -hmm. and you'll sort out the rest when you start to engage those funders directly. Yes. 
Absolutely. So next is collaborating and finalizing. So now we're going to take that draft project outline, and you're going to go back to your colleagues, back to your stakeholders, and uh, really show them what uh, what the status is now and get buy-in on that. Solicit input on it now. This is a, a great time to get their, their feedback and incorporate that feedback. Then you can basically take all of that feedback and you've got a final draft or a final project outline. And this project outline is sort of the basics that you're going to approach all of the potential places and funders with. You're going to end up, uh, and we'll get into it, you're going to end up doing a lot of customization, but this now is a complete and basic project outline that sort of highlights what your project is, what it's going to do, who it's going to benefit, how everything's going to work. So you want to use your leadership and influence to ensure that everybody that's involved with the project, from your colleagues, your stakeholders, your community, all have a high degree of ownership and a commitment um, to move the project forward. They've all read your project outline. Everyone's on board. They, they're saying? on board. Yeah. They've all bought into it. They feel like their comments have been incorporated. Everybody shares ownership in it. Because at the end of the day, a leader without followers is just someone out taking a walk, as our good friend Donnie Van Dyke told us. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, up next, our fifth key, cultivating potential funders. And this is really where we're taking that project outline. You put a tremendous amount of time and effort and collaboration into developing and starting to uh, get potential funders on board, finding out who's going to be a good source of funding for this project, who do you spend time and effort with, and who don't you. For sure, and like just like Dilbert said, and I always follow the immortal words of Dilbert. Of Dilbert. And essentially, don't sit behind your computer or sit behind your BlackBerry, reach out and phone people, get in touch with them. That's right. It's all about relationships. That's what we're going to talk about now. So, before you do that, gather some intel. Look out there, into the internet, check out the funders' web pages. We know you've already done that through your preliminary research, but you're getting down to brass tacks and you're getting the, the tactical, on-the-ground information to write a grant application now. So, go back to all those websites you might have been scoping out and get all their guides and forms, all kinds of documents yeah. you're going to get now to, to read the details and check everything out. What you're looking for in all of their websites and their guides, and this is a nice little checklist for you that you can just make sure to figure out for everyone so you don't forget some sort of like That's important right. areas or, or things. It's easy to miss a couple of things that might be really important in moving forward, but submission deadlines are really important. To, some funding agencies are only going to offer uh, a one-time intake, so yep. it's like, you know, apply by June 1st or, or we're closed. Thanks yep. for coming out. That's, that, you know. Or some of them have, in our case, we do it every quarter, so you can apply uh, four times a year to us. So every every funding program is going to be done differently. Let's check it out. Make sure that uh, you haven't missed the deadline, because otherwise you want to move on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, eligibility. So um, say you're, if you're a nonprofit, well, can nonprofits even apply to this program? Or, or, or if you're a First Nation or you're a local government, can you apply? Those are important things. And activities being different than obviously organization types. So we want to uh, do a daycare program. Well, is that even eligible? It might be in the guides and the fine print. You'll read that it's not eligible. And so then right there you can move on as well. Uh, proposal format is an important one to know. In our case, we prefer you to write it into a form so that we have standardized uh, information that we can present to our board of directors. But some funders do an expression of interest process. And then they get back to you and say, well, it sounds like we're kind of interested. Now you can fill out our form. So it's kind of different with yeah. every funding agency. Some use spreadsheets. It's all kinds of, it takes all kinds One of the nice things of having this detailed project outline is it really doesn't matter at the end of the day what format a potential funder wants. You've got all the information that you need to put into whatever format a funder is looking for. That's the project outline. So it's going to be so helpful. You're just going to be translating it into these different formats. Exactly. So... Um, what are the what is the funder's evaluation process and timeline? You're just going to want to check that out and say, well, okay, once I apply and there's that deadline, am I going to be waiting six months? Is it a two-week process? How is that going to proceed? Because I need to get my project off the ground. And if a certain funding agency is going to take six months, well, maybe it's not worth waiting. Exactly. And so you can just move on again. So that's, Especially if it's a small amount of money that you could get from that funder and has the potential to hang up the whole entire product. That's a really important part of it. And in other cases, you might just be reading their evaluation process and timeline and say, well, it looks like four months. 
And then you go back to your group and say, guys, we need this funding. This is the funding agency we need yeah. to apply to. We're not going to move on. We're going to we're going to tough it out. Yeah. And we're going to wait and uh, readjust our entire project around the funding because ultimately we need the money to do it. And that happens a lot. That's always going to happen to to people out there. Um, what are the funders' goals and priorities? So, what are they looking for? You want to know that so you can customize that pitch. You have your compelling project uh, outline, but now you can kind of we'll get into how you're going to customize that to the goals and priorities of the, each funder. Um, awards levels and funding maximums means how much are they willing to grant per project? Um, are they is it a ten thousand dollar per project? Is it a hundred? Is there no limit? Um, check that out. It's going to be important to know if you're within the ranges. Budgets and cost items. There may be specific things like they may not pay consultants or they may not pay for capital items, may not pay for people's salaries. Those are little details that are going to be very important to know if you've got those in your budget and they won't pay for it. Number eight, it's going to be super important. Who are you going to phone? Who are you going to talk to? And that's back to the whole section of this key cultivate. Who are you going to cultivate on the funders side of things? So, in the application forms, there's a few things you want to check out. Read their criteria, it's a lot of detail, but you're going to want to do that now before you start spending a lot of hours entering it and being halfway into it and then maybe find something that might not work. And then in those forms, look at your project outline and go, oh, well they're asking about um, you know, children that are going through the program um, that we want to create. Well, geez, we don't have that in our project outline at all. Let's go figure that out. Go back to your stakeholder groups, project partners, wherever you need to go, and figure out if you got a, an answer for that. Absolutely. You want to make sure that you address everything each funder is looking for. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, you'll find something that wasn't covered off in your project outline. Yes. So now it's time to, to work the forms. So before you, before you send in a project outline to a prospective funder, um, give them a phone call. Funders love to talk to people about their projects early on. So introduce the project, introduce your organization, introduce yourself. And you want to talk a little bit with the funder when you first engage them on the phone about how this potential project supports the mandate that the funder has. Because the funders are, are looking for opportunities to invest in projects that support their mandate. So here's some of the things you can talk about on the phone. So it is, when, once you've sort of introduced the project, you can ask the, the potential funder, is this a good fit for what you fund? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the appropriate funding request amounts? If there are any limits, what are they? That's like, um, you know, there may be, you're, in, you're within those ranges of the funding yep. max, maximums, but what's the typical amount? Yeah, it could be quite different. Yeah, it says you can, you'll fund up to $400,000, but what do you usually fund? Yes. Where, what, you know, what would be an acceptable amount to ask for? Uh, what are some of the the activities that you can fund and the criteria around that? You know, what's eligible, what's not? Um, what kind of format do we need to use? What type of process and decision time frame do you use as a funder? Those are the types of things you can flesh out on the phone. Uh, what are the deadlines for getting the applications in? Some, like, like we mentioned earlier, sometimes it's a rolling deadline, sometimes it's periodically, sometimes it's annually. You need to know these things. Uh, one thing I'd say on that too is, they might say, send it in a couple weeks before the deadline yeah. and I'll give you more of my time and I'll be able to help you out. And we do that a lot. We actually prefer to get applications in early so we can uh, discuss what the strengths and weaknesses are on the phone and give uh, share ideas, give tips on how to be better aligned so you can get funding. Another cool thing you can find out from funders is who are the typical funding partners that collaborate on projects with them? So if they're investing money in a project, who are some of the other funding partners that they work with that you might not have identified? You can sometimes get great leads on other funding sources from the funders that you're phoning to uh, talk to. And what are the opportunities for coaching? And uh, with Northern Development, opportunities are really high as long as you give us enough time before our deadlines to work with you. And probably a lot of the other funding agencies work in a similar way. So customize the project outline based on these phone calls. That's, that's a key. So you want to incorporate what you've learned from the uh, calls with every funder that you talked to that was engaged. Someone, if you had a, a call with someone that sounded like this could be something that they'd be interested in, especially if you do this, this, and this, then this is your chance to go back and incorporate that into your project outline. And then what you're basically doing now is you're, you're taking that project outline and you're making 
depending on how many funders you're talking to, two or three or four slightly varied versions of it that act as a sales pitch that's customized for each one of those potential funders. And then uh, send it back to them by email, follow it up with a phone call and find out, is this now, are we getting to something that you're, that's sort of really well aligned with what you do? Is this, yeah. is this uh, the type of thing we can get an application in on? So then based on how all of that goes, you are now finally at the time where you can say, okay, I'm either going to apply now or I'm not going to apply now. So if we've got an engaged funder who has basically told you that uh, they're very interested in funding the type of project you've brought to them and the time frame of their decision works with the timelines of your project, then it's time to put in an application. Absolutely. Uh, if a funder is telling you that hey, look, this is a pretty cool project. We just don't fund that. We don't fund these types of activities. Uh, we don't have any money available, or um, we might be interested in this, but it, it's not till about 12 months after you wanted to do the project. Well, there's not much There's not, not much sense applying. And what happens with most funders is they have a sort of a focus and an area that they can invest. And if you're outside of that area, they basically just can't invest in it. Yeah, so I mean, as much as everyone is going to be supportive and like the idea, um, there'll be other projects that rank yeah. higher, they can't find you. Yeah. It could be like three months of waiting to find yeah. out it's a no. And then you've held the entire problem. project up when a funder has basically said, look, we can't do this. And uh, you just want to focus on the engaged funders. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you're going to start building a house of cards yeah. and you'll be short money months yeah. later. Months later, yeah, exactly. So. Just like we said, if you're ready to apply, we're assuming you've gone down the apply road and you're going to rock the application. And you're going to do it all wearing kabuki makeup. <laughs> I think that's a, an excellent suggestion for every grant writer out there that they should uh, get into costume yeah. and uh, just get ready to go. So we'll tell you how to rock the application. Uh, first of all, prepare to launch. So go back and refresh your finalize any quotes. The process that you've been embarked and have embarked on could have been a couple months now. So just go check. Sometimes quotes are only good for 30 days. And just make sure everyone that uh, wants to help support you from your supplier side is still there and available. And their your new timelines are going to work out well. Um, really important. Lock that project timeline down. That's through talking with your suppliers, talking internally with your project partners. Let's let's figure out when are we going to start this. What are the main milestones and proceeding? And when is it going to be finished? Yeah, and what what has changed uh, in terms of the timeline since you started to talk to funders and so forth? It mm -hmm. might be time to just update those timelines in there to make sure that they're yeah. current. Lots of things could have changed, so yeah. we just want to go back and have that look like Dean says. And so uh, assemble all the documentation that's required by each funder. That could be the quotes, could be the letters of support. At this point, you're going to be well aware of what the different requirements are. So just go and start assembling those in your highly organized grant writing files. That's right. <laughs> So now we're going to be uh, doing a little bit on cutting through the jargon. What do some of these terms mean? And uh, first one's leveraging. So that's basically uh, the share of a funder's contribution to the total value of the project. And uh, a lot of funders have maximums they can contribute in terms of leverage. We have various ones in our programs. The provincial and federal programs have various levels. Sometimes a funder can provide 50% of a project, 20% of a project, 75% find out what those uh, those uh, maximums are, but that's really all it means when we're talking about project leveraging. Mm -hmm. Stacking limits will come up, especially in government programs, and that's really the limits. So in, in the sense of leveraging being a percentage where they'll say, okay, well, we'll do like 80%. Well, stacking's a little different. If you've got more than one government program funding your organization, like if you have operational funding coming from one of the ministries and you're applying to uh, another government program, they may be limited in how much uh, total money they can give you. Yeah. Um, another way to look at it, too, is stacking is they, the government may be limited if you apply to two different uh, government funding programs and you're trying to put them together. They see that as a stack yeah. and they go, well, we can only be half of the total funding between our two programs or something like that. So it might limit how much money you can get. Yeah, sometimes it's an issue, sometimes it's not. And, and it may not be, but jargon is jargon. And stacking limits is something you might hear, so yeah. it's just good to know what that is. Absolutely. <laughs> so next is in-kind versus a financial contribution. In-kind is basically just a contribution that isn't money. And uh, if you've got volunteer labor during the construction, 
uh, it might be considered as part of your in-kind contribution to the project. And even if it's not construction, it could be just like programs being delivered by volunteers. Absolutely. People look at that. Some some agencies allow it, some don't. Yeah. So um, monetizing donated materials and equipment, that's another form of it. It's not quite in-kind contributions because it's actual donated materials, maybe lumber, gravel, equipment, and it can be presented as a financial contribution quite often. It's best to try to monetize that. Yeah. And you can do that by securing a letter from the person that donated or the company that donated it. And it sort of demonstrates what the market value of that contribution might have been. So it's not the same as, you know, eight people with paintbrushes uh, helping out painting the outside of the building. It's this is a, we've donated this equipment time and this material and it has this type of a value. And many funders, us included, would count that as a, as a financial contribution. And then uh, volunteer labor. So this is your true in-kind labor. And the way we deal with that is you estimate how many hours of volunteer labor you're going to have, and some funders will break it down as how much of it is skilled labor, and that might be someone like a, an engineer that's volunteering some time. How much of it is unskilled, and that might be a bunch of people with uh, rakes. The paintbrush, paintbrushes. paintbrushes are part of it, you know, like if, depending on, um, even if you're not an engineer, you're, let's say you're an engineer but you're painting, yeah. well, you're going to go down to skilled labor for that time. Yeah. And so just how do you sort of estimate those hours? Exactly. And you want to monetize the hours by using the rates that funders specify. And that's one of the things that's important. You've got to check with each funder because different funders might have different rates for in-kind labor. Absolutely. So, um, and then you want to attach the time and, and the rates to confirm your estimate. So you just need to sort of document all of that. And it's worth the time it takes to do that because it all contributes to building the stack of funding that makes up the entire project budget moving forward. So another tactic is uh, as far as listing your funding sources. Very simple stuff, but organization name, the amounts that you're requesting from that organization, the type of funding. This is the real sort of trick here. Yeah. Um, so grant, loan, in-kind, an applicant giving financially to the project. That's important for all the funders to see, like how does that break down? Because they, they might be interested, like, well, is it all loan funding that's going on this thing? Like, is that feasible? Is it only volunteer dollars? They may not look at volunteering, so just specifying it's going to be so helpful as far as uh, clarity to the different funders. The confirmation being, like, whether or not there's been letters and um, actual dollars committed by the different funding partners. So, specifically on funding confirmation, for all the approved sources, you can do it via a letter, and that's pretty simple. Like when we approve funding, our board of directors uh, meets and they review a project and they say, yes, we're going to actually uh, very supportive of this. We want this to happen. Mm -hmm. Staff, please make it happen and start getting the checks ready when the project's uh, ready to go. So we'll send a letter. And that letter says, you know, we're basically fine. We're uh, legally obligated to fund you if you do these things. These are our subject twos, and we'd like to move forward and give you the, the dollars to start your project and be supportive of you. Uh, for unconfirmed sources, you can estimate the date, and that's just going to help the other funders know, like, if our board is approving it in May, are, are you going to have everything approved by somebody else not till September? That's, that's a question that's, that basically will really be very helpful. I'll just show you, um, and as far as the tactics here and, and being able to rock the application, on the funding sources, we're going to show you three different examples of how to, in a, in a form, and this is obviously real details here, and you're going to be applying to funders and funding programs that don't use these forms, but um, it, it might be just helpful to kind of move through and show you some real specific detailed examples. Real world examples. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So with Northern Development, the way we um, do this is we ask you, how much would you like from us? That's the top box we're looking at here um, for grant, and, and we do have a star saying maximum is 30. So this applicant, the example, is going for the full $30,000 grant. Um, and we ask you, what, what are the other funding sources? There's two other funding partners here, uh, Towns for Tomorrow. They're a provincial uh, funding program that does come out. And we'll show you their form in a second. And Cultural Spaces Canada, which is a federal funding program um, that's been available in recent years. And we'll show you their funding uh, form so that you'll be able to see the differences yeah. between ours and, and provincial and federal and how different they all are even though you're building a project uh, it's all going to be the same project 
in these examples, but three very different uh, ways of representing them in, to the yeah, funder. and showing the same information. Exactly the same information in different, in different ways that the funders look at it. And in the, the, the last one here that we do have is applicant contribution. So you can see in our form, we've asked, like, what are those? And the top two funding partners are doing grants, 200000 and 100000 and then a fundraising initiative by the applicant to do the $36,000. Um, and that basically the funding isn't confirmed for the provincial and federal funding, but there's some estimated dates provided. And we know just by looking at this that there's $366,000 that's a, the total project funding being looked at. So moving forward to the Canadian Heritage Funding, which is the Cultural Spaces Canada we just noted. Uh, this is their view of how they would like you to fill out their funding form. Um, and you can just see it instantly, it's quite different. One thing, it's bilingual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, So the top line on there is they have it broken down federal, provincial, municipal, private sector, or other. That's how they're going to group, and they call it revenues. That's, right. but that's funding sort, other funding sources. So federal, they have CCSF, that's Cultural Spaces, Can Canada Cultural Spaces Fund. I, I may be getting that slightly incorrect, but that's the fund you're applying to. $100,000, their form instantly, I think this is a spreadsheet, if I'm, uh, the Excel spreadsheet, if I, That's I, right. I am correct on that. But, so their spreadsheet calculates how much the percentage of the funding is for that. Towns for Tomorrow is a provincial, so you need to type in Towns for Tomorrow in the province, put the 200000 to tell them that, and the $36,000, in, in this case, we put it under municipal, because we, in this example, we said it was a municipality applying. If it was a non-profit, it would be down under other. So it's pretty simple there. Um, and then we have Northern Development Initiative Trust because it is a private corporation that's noted as private sector funding for the 30000 And you can see that the, the total here is the 36 plus the 330, so that it matches the same as the Northern Development Forum. Exact same information, but a totally different way of showing. Absolutely. And so uh, with the British Columbia Forum, this is the Towns for Tomorrow program, and they use a Word document where you click X's and type into these gray areas. And you can see here that they've said, is there other funding from local government or provincial agency? And we click yes, and it says if yes, and we've said cultural spaces fund. And we just write a note. And it's kind of free form. You can write whatever you want in yeah. that format. Um, and then as far as the money breakdown, we can just sort of see that it was the 366000 and this is how, they, in their view, it broke down with the last um, item E under 12 says $200,000 grant request. All the same. And they're looking for detailed cost estimates to be attached. Yeah, so they'd be looking at just like a pro probably a page out of, uh, I don't know, maybe your project over. Your project over. So yeah, that'll be really helpful in this case. <laughs> so we're looking at the, uh, the project budget now. So some keys to outlining the project budget. So the total project budget uh, outlined in your application just needs to match the total of the funding identified. And when they don't match, it's really important because when they don't match, you're either showing a shortfall, which means you're telling funders that even if they provide the funding for the project, you still can't make it go through. It costs more than the money yeah. you get. Yeah, if, if everybody says yes, you're still short, or and what doesn't work for funders just as much, you're asking for actually more money than you need for the funding, which would make your funder wonder why it is that they need to provide that funding to you in the first place. So you need to make sure those match. Um, you want to be pretty detailed, break the cost down into sort of logical groups and show all the specific costs. Um, where, where, the, where the application doesn't allow it, just attach a spreadsheet to show the su sufficient breakdown of all the associated pro costs with the project and show any of the capital items. And then if you've got quotes from suppliers or contractors, you want to attach those and show what those quotes and, and the amounts are. And so just like we showed you on the, the previous example, we'll sort of walk through these same funding applications for the same uh, project to show you how it works on the project budget side. So this one's the Northern Development uh, Program application. And we've got sort of the bold type budget items are what we've got listed in ours. Um, they're not individually broken down, but it sort of breaks the project out by, by sort of budget type. And it, shows that it's equal to the, the same uh, dollar value as what the funding is. 366 funding from our previous Three, example. Yeah. Exactly. And that's where um, we're really looking to see that those items match. When we go to that Cultural Spaces Canada application, theirs is uh, a 
a fair bit more complicated. In fact, it's even hard to read on here, but you can just see that really they, they break it down into a totally different way. They're sort of looking at what are the professional fees and honoraria that you're looking for? Is there building acquisition costs, uh, specialized technical equipment? Um, they, they sort of look at it through a different lens. So you just show them what they need to see in their form and you attach the same detailed project budget that you attach to ours to theirs. And then when we look at uh, Towns for Tomorrow, um, once again, it's a little more descriptive. So you just say there's some funding from another government or provincial agency. They're showing the cultural spaces money again, uh, the same dollars. Exactly the same. Uh, and then uh, the detailed cost estimates should be attached is what they're is what they're saying, and you can see that popping up there. So it's, it's again, everything sort of goes back to that detailed project outline and the project budget you did in there. You always, you attach that to all three, but each one individually you're showing slightly differently because that's the way the funders are looking for it. It's our specific needs for sure. Yeah, so next advice we give is apply early and seek feedback. Uh, we probably get 80% of our applications the day of the intake deadline. Is that yeah, right? it happens About a lot 80%? more. And you know what? People apply on the day of the deadline a lot more than we coach or mentor them to do yeah. that. And, and in some cases, the the actual project has been sitting around for a few months in terms of a concept or even a partially fleshed out project, but they saw the deadline, so they send it in. Um, it's a big opportunity to send it well ahead of the posted deadlines because a lot of people are going to give you an opportunity to make some changes. So get in early, make some personal contact with your funder to confirm that, uh, that it's been Picture received. Gone through, right? The email might have bounced. Yeah. Any other like, things can happen. Yeah. Don't don't uh, leave it to chance, right? Mm -hmm. And then if your funder is willing to provide you with feedback, uh, be receptive to that feedback because most funders are actually trying everything they can to help you be successful. So in, incorporate the feedback that funder is giving you and resubmit the application. That's the benefit of submitting it early. Oh, that's perfect. So the seventh key, the final key. The final key. And, um, you know, if you're Canadian, you'll remember that moment of the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. Yeah. And what's really interesting is the quote that Sidney Crosby made after the game. Well, see, I thought when I saw this, I thought he was celebrating a goal that won Canada gold medal in hockey. Yeah, you would have thought that, but there was a lot of grants that were written to different levels of government to make the Olympics a reality also. Yeah. And so um, I think that quote sort of speaks to some of the work that was involved in that. But really what this key is and what Sydney was also speaking to is how important as the grant writer, it's important to track and share those results. We showed you the grant tracking tool earlier, but no one's going to really have an idea of how much work you put into this. I think at this point of our workshop, you have an understanding of how much work's involved. And you need to be able to track and share those results with everybody in your community. And your as a grant writer, don't be scared to show your value. Perfectly stated. So show your value. Report to your stakeholders. Well, what are some keys to good reporting statistics that we've seen, actually? And these work really well, so totally make note of this. How many grants did you apply for while you were, while you were supporting different groups? What were the dollars applied for? It's, you know, really important, too, because there might be some significant dollar values involved. How much money has been approved? And how many projects were supported? So that's pretty interesting to see, like how much funding went into how many different types of projects. And here we are assuming that you're working with a, a number of different community groups. So it might be a little different for you if you're a grant writer just for your society, but take these into mind. I think they'll be helpful. Um, what was the dollar value of all the projects supported? And what were the number of projects fully funded? At the end of the day, you might have done a lot of work. You might have written a lot of project outlines, done a lot of community consulting. But how many projects did you work on that are actually fully funded? They're going to actually become reality in the community. Crucial statistics. That's the real bottom line number. And this is pretty interesting when you look at that. As far as all those projects that were fully funded, what was the value of those? That's the value of the contribution to the community in terms of dollars you're bringing in from government right. that you made as a reality working with your partners. We talk in terms of return on investment. And this is kind of an interesting thing you can do with your time. If you're a paid grant writer, of course, this is the thing. You might be a volunteer, and it might not be necessarily um, as um, relevant for you, but you could also look at what was your time worth if you took a, a dollar value of your time. But look at it this way and say, 
Well, how much funding have I had approved into the cost of my time and the cost that's been put to the grant? So an example would be $10,000 grant writing contract and um, the grant writer secured $250,000. Huge return on investment mm -hmm. and back to the leveraging jargon of the funding world, massive leverage. That's yeah. just a, an outstanding return on the amount of time and effort. And in our experience with the Northern Development's Grant Rating Support Program, this is not an uncommon uh, success ratio for grant writers. In fact, uh, I would say this is probably um, pretty standard. This is a, a average, if yeah, that. Yeah, uh, that. There's tremendous grant writers from across all of Central Northern BC. Yeah. Um, you know, those of you that are out there watching this, you know who you are. But uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive, and this is just a basic example. It's really yeah. easy to beat these numbers. So we're kind of wrapping up at this point. We've covered all of the seven keys that yeah. Dean and I have identified in grant writing. It's a comprehensive world. There's a lot involved in developing proposals, writing grants, making projects happen. But um, that's sort of the tips and tricks that yeah. we've learned through our experience. Absolutely, and, and you know, like we mentioned before, a tremendous amount of the success in getting projects uh, funding happens well before you submit the grant application. 90 plus percent of your yeah. time is spent yeah. and you probably were wondering watching this, wow, how long is this going to be and they haven't even talked about writing a grant. And we didn't, <laughs> we didn't actually spend a lot of time talking about writing grant applications. Because it gets to be, writing the grant is so easy yeah. when you've done things the right way and you've yeah. built the project in consensus. Yeah, it becomes uh, second nature. Well, it's everything. Once you've got an excellent project outline and your stakeholders and the community and the user groups have got a tremendous amount of support for the project and the way that it's formed, after that it's really doing the research as to what's out there that could fund it, cultivating those relationships with those funders, and then recrafting the story in the way that they need to see it in order to participate. So we really hope that uh, we really hope that this webinar has been extremely helpful to you. Um, you might have a lot of questions, and you might be looking for some additional support. So Dean and I are always available. You can yeah. actually through this through our web page, you can jump on. You can either get in touch with us by picking up the phone and cultivating us, or yeah. uh, you can just uh, jump on Skype. We'll, we can chat or answer any questions if it's uh, especially if it's within normal work hours. We're always yeah. available. We've got Instant Messenger there as well that you can uh, reach us with. So um, thanks very much for spending the time with us and going through. We hope that you're uh, an extremely successful grant writer. Yeah. Best of luck.